Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. A warm welcome to our inaugural Tissue Viability Society webinar. Thank you very much to the Tissue Viability Society and, and Manchester's European Science Festival for supporting the funding of this webinar um, as it's the European Science Festival week. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce my colleagues, Dr. Ray Samariwo from the University of Cardiff, Dr. Melanie Stevens from the University of Salford and Carol Barclay. We will all be presenting this evening. The webinar will consist of an exploration of how the Tissue Viability Society seating guidelines have been implemented. Some of the challenges and some hints and tips for you in terms of how you might be able to overcome some of those challenges and implement these guidelines in practice. Don't forget that this is a question and answer webinar. So enter questions as you think of them because it might be that if you don't think put them in contemporaneously that you forget a really important question that you'd like an answer to. And just to let you know, if you enjoy this evening, the um, webinar will be available on catch up. So share the information with your friends um, and colleagues and you'll be able to view it on YouTube, the TVS website and uh, Facebook Live. Okay, so let's start with the, uh, with the presentations. And we should have about 25 minutes for questions afterwards. Next slide, please. So this is just a little bit of a reminder for you. The NHS Improvement um, Organisation says that a pressure ulcer is uh, localised damage to the skin and or the underlying tissue, usually over a bony prominence, or it can be related to a medical or other device. And we've seen quite a lot of that pressure damage during COVID-19 from masks, etc. Now the pressure, can, the pressure damage can result from either sustained pressure, so being in one position for too long, but it can also include shear, and shear is quite an important force when it comes to seating. The damage can also be present itself as intact skin, like a category one or a deep tissue injury, or as an open ulcer, a categories two to four and unstageable. And one of the key characteristics of the development of pressure damage is the um, development of pain over a pressure ulcer site. Next slide, please. As you can see from here, this is, we're looking at the pelvis from the front and uh, just wanted to point out to you the particular areas that you might be interested in, in terms of um, the bony structures in the pelvis and their relationship to seating and pressure ulceration. You'll see in particular the sacrum, now we're actually looking at the pelvis, as I say, from the front. So the sacrum is behind, um, is at the rear of, of, the, of our bodies. But that is an area that um, is the most common site for pressure, for pressure ulceration to develop. And um, not just in seating, but just generally speaking. And the second most common site is heels. And the other thing to, to note is the ischium. So these are the bones that are actually designed for us to sit on. Um, but if we sit too long or we're sitting in a, on a surface or in a chair, for example, that's inappropriate, then we can get damage, particularly over these um, ischial areas. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, there are numerous, if you look at the left-hand side, there are numerous anatomical areas of the body which are in contact with the chair whilst we're seated. And we're not just talking about static chairs, we're also talking about wheelchairs here. And we really need to make sure that we consider all forms of seating. And so it's imperative that when we're thinking about where patients and how patients are sat, that we think about seating as part of the 24 hour of prevention and management of pressure ulcers and take that into account in terms of, uh, or in addition to, I suppose, the patient's individual risk. You'll see from this, the uh, patient on the right hand side of the slide that actually that patient is quite slouched, their uh, knees are not at a good angle, 
they're not at a right angle with their uh, thighs and that actually the patient is resting quite a lot of pressure through their sacral joint. Okay, next slide, please. So what I wanted to just sort of point out is give sort of, sort of some real life examples, if you like, of um, where patient seating is inappropriate. So to all intents and purposes, the lady sat in the wheelchair on the left-hand side looks like she's well positioned. But actually, if she were to put her arms on her armrest, you'll see that the armrests are actually quite high. But it isn't just about the seating, it's also about all the other things that go with it. And if that patient was to rest their arms on a too, on too high an armrest, what they would tend to do is they would tend to shuffle in the chair because it would feel uncomfortable. And they would be then the victim to um, a good deal of sheer force. The lady on the right hand side, as you can see, there is a mile between her back and the back of the chair. And we know that in the current seating position, her, eyes, uh, her legs are at a good right angle. However, most of us will sit back in the chair and she looks like she's got little legs like me and she's probably gonna end up with her legs sticking out in front of her and she'll end up being in a, in the, in a poor position. And she will be uncomfortable and she will end up sitting on the, the wrong part of her anatomy. So it's really important that when you're looking at seats, particularly in places like care homes where often the seats are all the same in the same you know, lounge or, um, uh, or a sort of area where people sit and, and um, converse, but actually we're not all the same size um, and we really need to take that into account when we're considering seating. Um, next slide, please. So these are better examples. So you can see that these um, characters are, they've got good right angle in, at the leg. Their feet are flat, either on the foot plate of the wheelchair. The, the armrests are well positioned and the gentleman in the chair is sat well back into the chair with his feet flat on the floor. Next slide, please. So not wishing to get too melodramatic, but one of the consequences of not getting it right in terms of seating is that patients can develop severe pressure damage. And this is a picture of a category four wound, which will develop down to um, bone, muscle, tendon. There's a huge risk of infection. And um, in my experience as a tissue viability nurse, patients invariably die before category four pressure ulcers heal. So it does have a significant impact. Okay, so thank you for listening and I'd like to hand you over to Carol Bartley. Thanks Nikki. Um, tonight I'm going to focus on a couple of areas to consider in the seating assessment and the couple of areas I'm looking at are the person and the chair or the cushion. So a key part of any seating assessment is the requirement to inform and educate the individual, the family member and carer about why the equipment is being provided how to use and maintain that piece of equipment and the potential impact of lifestyle on the prevention and management of pressure damage. So if we take a look at the person first, it's important to consider their diagnosis and relevant medical history. And this also includes pressure ulcer history. Their posture. So the presenting posture should be observed first. Then this should be followed by a hands-on postural assessment. This involves palpating the bony prominences of the pelvis. For example, the ITs, the GTs, the ASIS at the front of the pelvis and the sacrum at the back of the pelvis. So feel the ASIS to determine how level the pelvis is because we know an oblique pelvis means that pressure is forced down on, on one of the ITs more than the other and the pelvis needs to be level to ensure an even pressure distribution in sitting. So we know destructive postures over a period of time create more strain on the joints which leads to pain, reduced uh, flexibility, asymmetric postures and deformity, such as kyphosis, scoliosis and trunk rotation. So think about the mobility. Can they walk at all? Are they able to move about? And how do they move about? Uh, what do they do all day? Are they sitting in the chair all day? What's their routine? And what do they want to achieve themselves? So ask about the person's continence as well. And does that person have incontinence issues? Incontinence can increase the risk of skin breakdown in the buttock area, the top of the buttock crease and the coccyx. And as well, very important is the person's own opinion of that piece of equipment. 
It's important for us to listen and to listen to their concerns and discuss them. It's all about collaboration with that person and getting it right first time. So let me go on to look at the chair or the cushion. If you do a Google search and you put in any words such as pressure cushion, pressure chair or wheelchair, it will reveal hundreds of different types of equipment that can be considered and this can be a minefield. So when you're thinking about the type of chair or cushion, this very much depends on the results of your assessment and what information you've gained. So for example, looking at function, what is it you're looking for? Is it tilting space? Is it backrest recline? Is it the ability to move the, the chair from one place to another, for example, such as in a care home? Equally, can the person carry out their functions in the chair? Because we all know that function should never be compromised in our quest to achieve the best seated position. So think about additional supports as well. Can they be added as and when the needs of the person changes? For example, in a chair, you might want to add some thoracic supports. If it's in a cushion, you might be looking at thigh wedges or abduction wedges, pelvic obliquity wedges. And again, in the chair, you might be looking at headrests and armrests. The size as well depends very much on the postural assessment and the body size of the person. And we'll look, in that, look at that in the next slide. Pressure distribution. Is that equipment going to accommodate immersion and, and development of the pelvis and provide the pressure distribution qualities that's required? And lastly, comfort and aesthetics. So we may get the perfect correct fit, but if it's not comfortable or aesthetically pleasing, it won't be used. This leads to what we call equipment abandonment. And I'm sure we've all seen many examples of that in our practice. Next slide, please. So looking at the critical seating measurements, which also will include joint range of movement, it's preferable to sit the person on a firm surface with their feet supported either on the floor or on a box. In a clinic, a plinth is a great piece of equipment to do your measuring from. However, in the community where I work, I find a dining chair works very well. So you're looking at the person's uh, hip width or seat width. This is a measurement in a straight line from one side to the other. It's not a curved line around the person's abdomen. And you also have to ensure that you accommodate the fleshy parts of the thighs. The rear surface of knee to floor or lower leg measurement. You measure the person in their usual footwear because this determines the seat to ground height or the foot place height. The rear of the buttocks to the rear surface of the knee or seat depth. Make sure the measurement is the furthest rear point of the person. And you also need to include that gluteal shelf if somebody has a large bottom. The mid scapular height from the seat is very much uh, measurement, measurements around wheelchairs because this very often determines the backrest, the canvas height. The elbow to seat height will uh, establish the height of the armrests and the top of head um, to seat height is important for back and head support. And this is particularly relevant in static seating where very often the back, the backrest and headrests are integral to the chair. And the person's weight as well. It's essential that all, because all equipment, as we know, has a maximum user weight. So these measurements, along with your hands-on postural assessment, help you decide what equipment will best suit your user's needs. And for further information and more detail on what I've been talking about tonight, if you head over to the TVS website, you can download the seating guidelines free of charge. I'll now hand you over to Melanie Stevens, and thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Carol. So in this part of the presentation, I'm going to look at risk factors and alerts. So next slide, please. Because pressure ulcers affect adults who sit for extended periods of time in any care setting, it's really important to identify factors that increase the risk of developing pressure ulcers. Risk assessment is not only relevant when an adult is acutely unwell, but in any care setting provided by health and social care professionals, but is also in an integral part of a person's own self-care. So risk assessment will include screening and also is used to signal any changes in somebody's condition, whether that's an increase or decrease in their risk. There are many different factors that increase a person's risk of developing a pressure ulcer. And we know a systematic review of pressure ulcer risk factors and a consensus study involving international uh, experts in the pressure ulcer field allowed the numerous risk factors associated with pressure ulcer development to be carefully considered. And they found in, uh, initial risk screening factors included a mobility status of the adult, the skin status of the adult, 
and the use of clinical judgment. And once these three factors have been assessed, further screening can be completed with a more detailed assessment of risk. And this includes analysis of independent movement of the adult, their sensory perception and responses, a current detailed skin assessment, their previous pressure ulcer history, perfusion of the skin, their nutritional intake, the amount of moisture that comes to the skin from um, exudate, uh, urine, feces, saliva, and whether they have a predisposing condition of diabetes. So obviously this list of factors aren't exhaustive and there are also less common risk factors, but there's some really useful tests on the React to Red website that can be used by adults who sit for extended periods of time, their carers or any health and social care professionals. And also there are useful links and resources at the end of the seating guidelines. We know it's really important to assess risk factors for pressure ulcer formation for people that sit for long periods, because this helps us provide care, we're risk aware, and we can implement the right care and equipment to reduce these risks. So it's really important to check your local service and policy for which risk assessment tool is used. For example, it could be something called the Purpose T. Next slide, please. So within the guidelines, um, the stakeholders who assisted in the development were committed to the delivery of safe and efficient care. And it was agreed that we would communicate safety critical information and guidance called alerts. And in the guidelines, there's seven alerts, but I'm just gonna go through a few this evening. So a really important one is to check other areas of the skin in a seated adult, such as the palms of their hands, the genitals, and where equipment is attached, such as a lap, be lap belt or a catheter leg bag. Using a footstool will not reduce edema of the legs. This position actually increases pressure on the sacrum and buttocks, and it actually impedes the sit to stand transfer mobility. So we suggest that you read other guidelines that pertain to swelling of the legs, appropriate to the person's condition and the cause of their swelling. We want you to take care with the recline feature on chairs and wheelchairs, as when they're used alone, it actually can lead to sliding in the chair, and this increases shear and friction forces. And this can occur whether you're reclining an adult or you, whether you're returning, to them, returning them to their upright position. And standing should be part of the 24 hour pressure ulcer prevention and management program for adults with short or long term mobility problems if they're able to do so. We know that standing proffers pressure relief, but also increases functional reach, independence, vital organ capacity, improved circulation and passive range of motion. It can also reduce the risk of constipation, urinary tract infections, abnormal muscle tone, skeletal deformities, and enhances well-being. Now I'm going to pass you on to Ray, who's going to talk about the survey and our findings. All right, thank you very much, Melanie, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, so I'm Ray, I'm going to be talking to you today, this evening, about um, work we've done in terms of evaluating the Tissue Viability Society seating guidelines and how we think that theory can help with implementation. I think it's quite apt actually, uh, given the title of this session is about lost in translation. Um, so I'm delighted to be sharing some work we've done with you about how guidelines can be implemented. And I'll be keen to get your feedback um, after I finish my talk as well. So can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so just to say that we don't have any conflict of interest. And although I am leading the presentation, I'm presenting on behalf of um, Nikki, Carol, and Melanie. So this is the structure of my talk over the next 10 minutes or so. So I'll give you a little bit of background to the work that we did, um, how it was informed by a way of thinking or a theoretical framework, what our aims and methods were, and what we came up with in terms of a theory that hopefully will be of value to you in terms of trying to implement these seating guidelines and any other guidelines that you might identify. Um, and then I'll discuss some of the results and hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss some of the questions you've already posed but also questions around the theory and the model that we've developed as well. Next slide, please. Right, so we know that um, in terms of improving healthcare uh, and enhancing the care that delivered to people, that about a third of healthcare or just over a third of healthcare is actually inconsistent with what is written in the guidelines. And in fact, it's actually wasteful or harmful. We also know that over the last couple of decades, there are a tremendous amount of guidelines that have been published 
um, which have been used to inform uh, patient care uh, in a variety of different uh, manner, but also how we look after people, because it isn't just about patients, it's also about how we look after people in the community. And if you just pause, if you just reflect for a moment on this year and COVID, if you just look at the number of guidelines that have been published over the last year, it's amazing how many guidelines get published. Um, but as you can see, actually implementing these guidelines is a bit more challenging. The same also applies to wound care, including seating as well. So there are many national and international guidelines that have been published out there, but their translation into practice and, and policy is actually very variable. Um, and these differences in terms of how people implement things um, are down to a variety of different reasons. Our view is that very much is due to the fact that healthcare systems are complex. Um, and it, again, it isn't just about healthcare, but it's also about social care. So it's quite complex. And I think we can see with COVID and how the guidelines have been implemented across different parts of the UK, different things happen in different places for a variety of different reasons. And sadly, politics comes into play, even in the work that we do. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of trying to come up with a theory uh, or trying to help people to translate our guidelines, um, I just want to give you an oversight of how we're thinking, our theoretical framework, so how we're thinking about this whole issue of implementation. And basically, there are two ways of thinking about how we can implement guidelines into practice. One view, which I'd argue is the more traditional view, is that actually implementing guidelines into practice and policy is a straightforward process. It's a linear process, and there are specific gaps that you need to overcome. So typically you hear people saying, well, all we need to do is we need to have shiny new guidelines. We need to have a couple of uh, education and training programs, give people the resources, and then they'll do what they're told. Um, a more recent and a more nuanced view is that actually uh, implementing guidelines into practice is a more complicated process. And it's more like a cycle rather than a linear process. And this takes place in different health and social care settings. So the community is very different from hospitals and things work very differently in the community. And in all these environments, whether it's a healthcare setting or a social care setting, things are always evolving constantly in line with the cultural context. Um, and our view, I guess, as, as, a, as, as a team of researchers who led this project, is that actually the second view is more realistic and it tends to reflect more of what's going on, that things are changing all the time. And again, I'll draw an example of COVID because it's all something we're familiar with. If you think about how things have evolved over the last year, there's been a tremendous amount of change. And even now things are still changing. So some of you are in lockdown, some of you may be out of lockdown. Next slide, please. So our aim as part of this project was to try and generate a theory that hopefully will be of some value to you and to us all in terms of trying to translate these seating guidelines into policy and practice. So what we did is we undertook a critical analysis of wound care policy practice, as well as wider literature informed by way of thinking or theoretical framework. We also um, appraise some of the findings from uh, an evaluation of the TVS seating guidelines as well. And this analysis of wound care policy and practice was also informed by reflections and experiences as clinicians, educators, um, and academics. So as you can see, we're all from a diverse uh, set of backgrounds and from different parts of the United Kingdom as well. So all these things, we use them to inform our development of this particular model. Next slide, please. So um, our results were basically, when we looked at the TVS seating guidelines and the feedback that we've received, we felt that there are different stages um, in the implementation of wound care research guidelines, in particular the seating guidelines, which we focused on, and they're influenced by a variety of different factors. Um, and in our opinion, basically implementing wound care guidelines, in particular seating guidelines, is a cyclical process with four key stages. And the four key stages are basically, first of all, an individual reads the guidelines and start to change their own practice. Then a group of people, normally a team of people, begin to change how they do things, how they deliver care to people that they're looking after. Then the policy in a particular setting starts to change as well. And then over time, the culture in that particular place changes completely. Um, and in our view, each of these stages in the cycle can be defined as something called a liminal space or a threshold. So I'll explain what that is in a moment. Next slide, please. So a liminal space or threshold is a situation, event or encounter that a person goes through, which makes them change their perspective, way of thinking or identity to a different perspective, way of thinking or identity. So the best example I can give here is like COVID. So at the beginning of this year, people had certain views about wearing masks, for example. Now that we've all been through COVID um, and we're sort of hopefully going towards the end, we now have a different views about wearing masks. It's perfectly normal to avoid people, not to shake their hands. So it's been a massive change for us all. 
And this concept of liminal spaces is known very widely. And basically these liminal spaces or thresholds, the sort of plain English uh, equivalent of liminal space is just a threshold. So we know that these exist uh, be between theory and practice. So if you think about everyday situations like assembling flat pack furniture, the instructions and actually putting it together yourself can often be very different. But for those of you who like cooking and baking as well, sometimes you buy the shiny new cookbook or you download it to your electronic device and you try and bake a cake or prepare the meal, sometimes it doesn't quite look like it does in the shiny picture. Okay, so these liminal spaces are known to exist. And in health, you also know that they exist between uh, universities or colleges and the right of clinical practice. So my day job is I work for university, Cardiff University, and I know that working with all the students from different professions and backgrounds, when they go out into practice, the reality of what they encounter is very, very different. So what we've done as a sort of project team is to extend this concept of liminal spaces or thresholds to different stages in the implementation um, of wound care guidelines. Next slide, please. So on your screen now, you've got a visual summary um, of the model. So we call it uh, the TIP theory, the translation or implementation into policy and, policy and practice theory. TIP for short, because a bit of a mouthful. So that sort of summarizes the process that people go through. So what I'd like to do now is just to take you through each of these stages and how we think they relate to implementing guidelines into practice. Next slide, please. So in the first liminal space, which is about the individual and their perspective, um, the very first narrative that people, these are the sort of narratives or stories that people have told us. These are the key factors that implement on, that, that affect how guidelines are implemented into practice. So it's about the person's understanding of the guidelines. Do they understand what, what the guidelines are saying? And do they understand what their role is in bringing about change in the way that they deliver care? It's also about permission. So the person who's reading the guidelines, do they have the permission to be able to implement the change that's required? Because sometimes they may not have, depending on, on where they stand in their profession. Belief is also a really important thing. So does the person who's reading the guidelines, do they believe what they're reading or do they have doubts? And again, we've seen this with COVID, that there are people who still have doubts about some of the guidance that they're given. So all of these things can affect how guidelines are implemented into practice. Independence is also a really important factor. So the person who's reading the guidelines or the person you're asking to change their practice, do they have enough independence to be able to actually make that change? Because sometimes it depends on the quality of the leadership as well. So if they have a very... Uh, autocratic leader, it can be hard for the individual to actually make the changes that they think uh, should be made. Um, but also closely aligned to that is freedom. So does the person have the freedom to make the change that's required? Do they have the freedom to be able to implement the guidelines? So all of these things are really important things that are important in terms of getting people to engage with the guidelines. And we feel that all of these things are, are sort of the first step. So if you can get people to understand the guidelines, feel that they have the permission, they believe in the guidelines, and uh, have the independence and freedom to implement them, then you can progress into the next stage of, um, of implementing the guidelines. Next slide, please. So the next step in the cycle, we called what we do. And this is about what the team does. So once you've convinced the individual, it's about convincing the team. And this is about going from what one person thinks that they should do and what their role is to the roles and duties of the wider team as well. So it's shifting from what the person does to the duty of the whole team. So the collective of the team, what do they think is their duty? What is the know-how of the team? Because in whatever team you belong to, all of you have different expertise, you all bring something slightly different to the team. So it's important to try and bring that together in terms of implementing the guidelines. It's also about what the team believes they do. So as a team, each team has its own sort of culture or, or values or beliefs. So what does that group of people believe is their role in terms of delivering care? And also where care is given. And I think that's important as well, because most guidelines, they can be a tendency to focus on hospitals, which is kind of an easy reach. But actually, in the wider context, the majority of care that's delivered is delivered to people in the community. So are those guidelines going to be implemented to benefit people in their own homes? How might they be implemented to benefit people in residential homes or care homes? But also perhaps people receive care in GP settings. So we feel this is a very important second stage or threshold that you have to go through when you're trying to ensure that the guidelines actually bring about meaningful change in practice. Next slide, please. Then the third uh, part of the uh, cycle is uh, where, where you get changes to policy. And these are the narratives or stories that people told us that when they were in this stage, they, they felt very much that they changed their entire documentation. What they documented in their care plans were all linked directly to the guidelines. So there's a clear link between what's in the guidelines and what they're documenting. 
they're also using the guidelines to inform education and training. So we can't away from education and training. It is really important. Um, but obviously, when something is embedded in policy, you need to make sure everyone understands it and is able to implement it appropriately. But also the guidelines then began to influence quality assessment. So in terms of when people are reviewing the quality of care, they were referring to the guidelines and using those as the benchmark for ensuring that they consistently deliver the best possible care. Next slide, please. Um, and then in the final step of our sort of cycle um, of implementing the guidelines, the key narratives that people reported to us is basically once they got to the stage, they were fairly confident that the care that they're delivering to the people that they're looking after across a variety of different settings was actually based on the guidelines and they were monitoring that consistently. Also, personally, they say that in terms of their own professional development and revalidation, they're using the guidelines as the basis for their own reflections. So they're reflecting on their own practice and the extent to which they were drawing upon the guidelines to influence the care that they delivered to patients. In a few settings, they talked about the fact that they're undertaking quality improvement projects. So their particular focus in this case on improving the quality of seating and they're using the recommendations from the guidelines as a sort of basis for their, their PDSA cycle, their plan do study act cycles. So very much at this point, the guidelines were fully embedded in practice and were being used to drive forward the quality of care and the quality of seating that people receive to try and prevent them getting pressure ulcers. Next slide, please. So again, I just thought I'd bring us back um, to a summary of the model and the theory, just that you can see how it all um, ties together quite nicely. And I just want to pause for a moment just to give you a chance to have a look at the guidelines and to think about where you might be. Um, because one of the reasons why I was keen to present this to you today is to try and get your feedback um, about the model and sort of where you, think it, where you think you are and whether or not you think it's useful. But also after the webinar today, we will be sending out a survey. So we're very keen to get your feedback on how relevant you think this particular model might be and how useful you think it might be um, in terms of translating the seating guidelines, but also any other wound care related guidelines um, that are relevant to your own practice. Next slide, please. So to conclude, um, and I guess just to recap, um, our view as a project team is that implementing wound care guidelines like the seating guidelines is a cyclical process in which people go through different stages or liminal spaces or thresholds. So our recommendation is that uh, people work in clinical practice or in the community, wherever you work, you make sure that if you're trying to implement guidelines into practice, you support people to move through the different stages or liminal spaces in order to ensure that uh, the wound, -related, wound care related guidelines are actually embedded into practice. Um, this is a theory and it's a model based on theory and therefore we feel it needs to be further developed and tested in future research. And this is why we're keen to get your sort of feedback and thoughts on how you think the model works. But also it's important for further research, I guess, to establish how best to integrate um, wound related guidelines into practice. Now I've given my presentation without any references. There are references um, if you want to look at them. So on the TVS website for you to have a look at. And just to round off my, my talk and the sort of spoken part of the webinar is just to say, Thank you very much to the Tishfab Society for supporting us to deliver this webinar, but also to the Economic and Social Research Council who funded uh, this project and the webinar today as well. And they're supporting this as part of the Festival of Social Science. And last but not least, thank you very much to all of you for taking the time out this evening to join us. Um, I believe we're now going to have time for um, a question and answer session. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, that was really, uh, that went really well, I think, um, and I hope that you guys have enjoyed it. So we've got quite a few questions. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll probably work my way through them and uh, and choose who I think is probably the most relevant person to answer them. But um, if you feel like you want to chip in, then please feel free to do so. So the first question is, um, I would like to know what we do, what we can do to convince the wheelchair assessment team when we refer residents to them that they need to have a special wheelchair due to posture as they are refusing them and they don't know the resident as we do. Uh, Carol, is that one for you? Uh, yes, um, I think that's, that could be a, a lot more of a localised issue rather than um, and maybe a national issue. I don't know where the person who posted the question is from, I think it's quite tricky because, uh, I, I, you know, in my experience, wheelchair services very, very often have different uh, priorities as to what they will and won't supply, and they usually have 
um, a criteria of what they will or won't supply. I think it's fantastic that the whoever it is is talking about residential homes because they're obviously thinking beyond what we would normally, you know, would normally expect really because and, and for them to be that proactive and uh, be quite nice if they're in the area where I was in because I would love to have that collaboration with somebody. I think probably the, the issue is is down to local policy and what people will or won't um, supply. But what I would say is try and somehow get a relationship with that local wheelchair service, invite them in or, you know, have a chat, start that way, get them in, get to know them, and then they could get to know the, to, to know the residents more. I do know there's a lot of pressure on wheelchair services as well uh, with waiting lists for people. So that, that might come into it without knowing the area or whatever. I can't give a very definitive answer. But I would say, obviously, always communication is the best way forward and trying to establish that relationship with them. Sometimes it's very hard when there's a when there's what you call a set criteria and people then have to work within that. We can't maybe step outside of that. But I think we need to think more about stepping outside and developing those relationships as well. Because it's a really big issue in residential homes, seating people and trying to get them seated properly as well. It's it's very difficult for them. The area where I am, we're lucky in that we can go into residential nursing homes and we can, we can provide static seating. Um, if it's a residential home, we can. Um, so where I am is, is, is great because we're able to do that and we can we can get there. And, and it's all about educating, educating each other as well about what the problems are and why you want to, why, why particularly a wheelchair, why not a, another type of chair. If the person isn't going out anywhere, they're moving from A to B, um, why would, you know, do they need a particularly postural wheelchair or is it a posture chair that they need instead? I hope that yeah. answers the question. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there's one for you, Ray, here. And so it says, so we've been asked, should we see more focus on positioning of patients at undergrad level for nursing? Yeah, I, I think there's always scope to integrate more um, stuff about seating and wound care in general in undergraduate education. I think the challenge, though, is that there's a lot that the NMC um, expects student nurses to be taught at undergraduate level. And the challenge is finding space for wound care. So as of, I think, um, this semester in September, there's a whole new curriculum, which is very different. And there's more of a focus on clinical assessment. So it's always a struggle to try and get wound care related um, issues into the curriculum. And it isn't just a nursing issue because I have colleagues in occupational therapy as well and physiotherapy. Um, and it's a challenge to get them involved or engaged. So I know a lot of them are involved in posture related issues, but their focus tends to be slightly different. So yes, there is plenty of scope for us to, to integrate that, but I guess it's about how we can find a common narrative to encourage and support people and, mo and a more collegiate approach. Because overall, one of the challenges I think with wound care in general is it's often seen as a nursing issue when really it's a multidisciplinary issue. And it's about challenging that narrative and getting people to see it from the perspective of the person who has the wound as opposed to a particular profession. Mm. Can I add to that? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, can I just say that also that the wonderful thing about undergraduate programmes is that it is a collaboration between the university and clinical practice and many students have something called a portfolio or a personal development record or personal development plans and therefore if you're a clinician and you're a practice educator and assessor or a supervisor of a student and sometimes if you know that you're working with an area where uh, the patients or the adults that you care for require postural real you know support that they could they could write um, a goal in relation to learning more about postural alignment or postural support and the roles of the members of the interprofessional team and I think that we all have that lovely responsibility for our students don't we um, you know in their development of all of this knowledge and skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very can true. I, well said. Can I just come in from the AHP point of view? Uh, I agree with what Melanie Ray have said, but I absolutely believe that there should be a module, at least one module in the undergraduate programme for every occupational therapy uh, programme that actually looks at the fundamentals of seating and pressure management. Because in my experience, I know that we have some brilliant OTs and they, they haven't got the confidence with the seating and they're brilliant in any, any other respect. It's because they haven't done the fundamentals. And if they have, and then they come out then into placement or they qualify, that they just have the confidence just to even start that process. Mm 
And I think it's really important and I think it should be in there. And it's definitely something that is occupational therapy related. Uh, I'm not sure about the physiotherapy program, but I do believe that they should too. It's important, you know, seating is so essential for all the people that we see. Um, and when you look at the costs as well, if, with the pressure, the pressure ulcers and the damage, you know, it, it's phenomenal amounts of money that could be saved by a whole collective of people as a team, like they're not just relying on the nurses as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Carol, I think this is another one for you. Um, why do you feel that right angles at the knee is good? Uh, with shortened hamstrings, this could pull the person into posterior pelvic tilt. Uh, I don't necessarily think that uh, right angles at the knees are good. Um, I, you know, it depends on the person. And certainly if somebody's got tightened hamstrings, this is all part of the assessment. And this is why the assessment is so important. Because if somebody has got tightened hamstrings, there's definitely things you can do in a chair for that. For example, chamfer the cushion back to accommodate those hamstrings. So the person doesn't then um, come forward and sit in a posterior pelvic tilt. So I wouldn't necessarily say that, um, you know, it's, it's important to be sitting at, because uh, we know that anyway, to be sitting at a 90, 90, 90, because most people don't and they can't hold that position for very long anyway, because you've got the effects of gravity and everything that are all working to pull us down anyway. And it's quite hard to keep that position. And as we know, we all, we, we shuffle around and move around. So we don't sit very long in that position. So my own personal perspective is I don't particularly think it, you know, it's good for some people if they can manage it, but if that person can't manage it, it's about the assessment and making the necessary um, arrangements and requirements to accommodate that person and, and, and accommodate their uh, postural asymmetries. And that includes contractures as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so um, I could possibly take this one, give you guys a rest. <laughs> So, um, so the question is, have you noticed an increase in problems since COVID due to faster discharges taking place, resulting in patients being discharged um, to be nursed in bed rather than getting support at the point of discharge? Um, well, I think we can probably all contribute to this, but I'll make a start. So um, my background's in community nursing and um, I think that it's been become very clear, particularly during the second wave um, in our local area in the north, that um, that you know the the pressure on the system is even greater than during the first wave, and as a result of that, there is you know necessarily um, the encouragement of pay people who don't need to be in hospital to get home as quickly as possible. Um, so I suppose that's a challenge that we have to face. And, and as a result of that, and something that I've experienced often in working in a community setting is that you sometimes have to pick up um, the requirements of that patient once they're home. And whilst that's not ideal, um, I think it's just a, a fact of, you know, of life. And it's happened, you know, for a long time in terms of poor discharges and things into community settings. Uh, but I think, I think, what I hope has probably been demonstrated through this webinar is that is the actual absolute value of all working together as an MDT to support patients at the point of discharge, to liaise with your local physio and your local OT, to ensure that the GP is aware of the state of the status of the patient on discharge, and to um, you know get to to do the initial assessments as quickly as possible, but as well as possible in order that you can avoid as much risk in terms of pressure damage. Um, anybody else want to say anything on that one or? Can I just say something about community as well, being in the community myself? Um, yeah, I'm finding as well, some of the people that I'm seeing, um, there's quite a, a number of people with moisture lesions. I haven't seen that many people before and it's very difficult then to try and, um, work with getting that person sitting out so I have been working with uh, TVNs and district nurses as well and with families because what I found is families have been absolutely fantastic in trying to work with us and trying to understand the difficulties as well as them looking after their loved ones and the stress that they're under too so it's really um, I think it's uh, really important like you said that for me as an OT if anybody uh, has a pressure any pressure damage I will immediately go and see who the doctor is 
contact the district nurse and try and have a chat with them and work together with them. Yeah, thank you. Um, Melanie, can you answer this one? Do you feel that services are generally too passive when considering seating provision due to financial implications? Whereas if seating was more readily provided, perhaps longer term problems could be resolved. Um, I think it's a mixture of things, isn't it? I think most things in um, health and social care, they don't sit in splendid isolation. There are many different constructs. And I think the liminal spaces theory fits that bill that we all have a professional responsibility and a personal one if you are an individual who remains seated for extended periods of time that we all we all have that responsibility to you know be involved in care you know we think about person-centered care and the nhs long-term plan or king's fund or nuffield trust there's lots of documents out there that we're all party to that and then we move from our personal responsibilities to the sex second liminal space which is then about working with others that this is this requires a, an interprofessional team and to mm -hmm. me it moves from multidisciplinary working into professional working is learning from with and about each other to improve care for others or improve services for others and then that becomes part of policy and practice and education which then continues on and leads to that reflection for revalidation uh, as part of that growth. So it's that, if anybody has read the work of Patricia Benner, it's moving from novice to expert, mm -hmm. but moving back to novice again on regular occasions, this cyclical process. So I think it's many social constructs. I think we, we can't just blame it on one thing or consider it from one point of view. Uh, and that's why it's so important. I think from, every, from all the speakers this evening, we've all talked about if you learn more about other professions and their role in pressure ulcer prevention and management from seating and posture, um, we actually improve our knowledge and our skill set. So we blur our boundaries and improve the care and services we deliver. I hope that answers things. Okay. I think, can I, can I just add something to that as well, in terms of finances and things like that, 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 that you know, we, there is a responsibility um, around that and, 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 and legally we can't have a blanket policy that says we can't supply something because there isn't any money for it anyway, and I think we need to be mindful of that. And sometimes it's difficult for us as practitioners when there is, when there is a, a sort of an unwritten, we don't supply, we don't do this or we don't do that. And sometimes maybe I'm going back to where I am now. I happen to have a fantastic manager who will sit down and listen to what we're saying, listen to our clinical reasoning. And if we get our clinical reasoning right, they're very happy to support it. So, but I do understand that it is difficult in some places. And I've worked in places as well where it's, we don't supply those. I think that's a really good comment, Carol, because it's about the defence of a clinical decision through clinical reasoning. And if anybody's read Levitt Jones or a the, the process of assessment, plan, implement and evaluate, that helps you with your defence. Right, yeah, good, thank you. Ray, one for you. Um, absolutely fascinated by the concept of liminal space and theory, practice gap. But does it rely on an assumption of a solid understanding of underpinning theory? Uh, <laughs> I think you'll be glad to know that the Answer short- Answer it in two, two words. <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is no. Um, so what I didn't say in my presentation is that um, everyone and I are, are working on a paper, the more academic paper, um, and we hope to get that done by the end of the year to be published early next year. But the version of the model I've given you is in plain English, and that's the whole purpose is you don't have to understand the theory. If you want the, the sort of hard scientific paper, that's on the way, but you don't have to understand the theory. The reason why you put together the sort of tip model and theory was just to help everyone to understand how you can try and overcome uh, some of these barriers. Because I, I noticed in the chat, quite a few people have referred to the barriers that exist in clinical practice. Mm -hmm. So it's about trying to understand, I guess, why people can resist guidelines. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to use the example of the first liminal space. So what happens normally is you're shining your guidelines, you say to people, implement the guidelines, and automatically everyone's ego goes up. Who are you telling me to do this? Where's the evidence? I don't believe your evidence. I don't care about your evidence. But if you have this sort of theory, which is just basically a way of thinking, then perhaps you can approach people in a different way. And say, for example, oh, Nikki, I noticed you do a lot of good work around wound care. 
what do you think about the guidelines? Is there anything there for you? So it's about trying to help you to win people around. And I think that's, that's the most effective way. I know the other levers that we can implement, like forcing people or making them go to education and training. But if you want lasting change, it's about winning people. And the key often is just about getting people to understand how, to understand first of all, what they can do, how it might make things easier for them um, and how they can contribute to patient care. Because everyone, no matter how good or bad they are, wants to do their best for the patients. It's about trying to give them a, um, uh, a positive message, I guess, showing them what they can do and just having that discussion because often people just dismiss the guidelines without actually reading them. But also there are people with certain views about different types of evidence. So it's just about trying to find a way in. That doesn't bring up their ego and then trying to get them to negotiate that. I do appreciate it's easy for me to say that because we have different characters and different egos that we have to manage. But no, you don't have to understand that in pink theory. It was just a useful frame of reference, I think, that we all felt could help you in terms of trying to overcome some of these barriers. It's about trying to win the individuals. So if you are in this sort of situation, I guess, try and pick off individual people and try and persuade them. And then you get other people on board and then hopefully it snowballs um, a little bit further down the process. Thank you. Carol, and a really practical one here. Yes. Um, I was wondering when measuring for appropriate seating, I've been advised one to two inches or two finger widths on either side of the hips and seat depth. Is this correct? Uh, yes, it is, um, by and large. It's not an exact science. Uh, again, what I want to emphasize is the importance of that assessment of, that, of the person, and it's a very individual assessment. So, and try and get away from the, from the idea that, oh, everyone should have this or that. It very much depends on the, on the person that you are seeing. But yes, as a general rule, if, I, if I'm doing a seating assessment, I just make sure that I can get my hands down the side of the chair, either side of the, the person's hips. And when it comes to the popliteal area, make sure, yeah, there's probably two finger width between the back of the seat cushion and the, and the popliteal area to prevent any, um, a, any pressure in that area because there's nerves running in the back of that area as well so the person could then suffer with things like um, you know sort of um, pins and needles and that kind of thing the leg might go numb so it's really important so yes I would say to that person whoever asked that question that's a good question uh, yeah and just remember it's an individual it's the individual as well that you're looking at. Okay thank you. Melanie um, as a student, I do tend to feel that repositioning tends to fall to the healthcare assistants on the wards. And it's often healthcare assistants who check the skin and pressure areas more than the nurses, which I think is wrong, as it is fundamental in nursing. What's your view on that? Um, I understand the complexities of the world that we live in in clinical practice. And I was I started my nursing career as a healthcare assistant and also understand the importance of their role and also their willingness to develop knowledge and skills so therefore actually skin assessment the ability to assess somebody's skin and then report it is the role of the healthcare assistant and then it's the role of the registrant to then do something about that with in discourse in conversation with the patient and the healthcare assistant, so they can work collaboratively together. So to me, it's a fundamental skill of everybody. You know, it should be doctors, nurses, physios, OTs, the patient, the carers. And therefore, I'd, I'd, having been a healthcare assistant and also now as a registrant, I think it's everybody's business. And I do understand that on a busy unit, a busy ward, that healthcare assistants will check the skin. But as long as they're checking it correctly and they've been assessed as competent to do so and are reporting it and recording it correctly then I, I can't see an issue with that because I would have I would teach my patients to assess their own skin because I want to empower them to have that knowledge and skills it's about identification and then obviously um, escalating concerns yeah Okay, thank you. So I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, any questions that we don't get to this evening, we'll be able to respond um, to those on the TBS website, um, but we'll hopefully get through, through a couple more. Um, so Ray, um, how do you suggest that clinicians are supported to move through the different stages of liminal spaces to ensure that guidelines can be embedded in practice? 
And then as a second bit about interpretation being very objective and personality factors and things, which I think you've probably already covered, but how do you think we can support people to move through those spaces? Yeah, so I think there are a variety of different um, steps that you can take. I think the first thing is identifying key people who you think uh, are sort of easy wins, so people who can get on board. Um, I think we also agree that it's good to have a champion, so a local champion who champion the cause and try and, and drive change forward. And that doesn't necessarily always have to be a healthcare professional, it can be a support worker. Sometimes they're a lot better at driving forward change. So as, as someone has pointed out that actually patient representation is often done by the people. But I think it's about identifying a local champion, identifying the right people and getting them on board, but also having a very simple message that everyone can understand. Um, and it needs to be as simple as possible and as basic as possible, just to enable people um, to move forward. I'll just add on very quickly, there's another question about the quality of evidence related to seating mm. and how that might affect implementation. And, and that's, that is true, that the quality of evidence is always perhaps what it should be. But in fairness, I think that applies to many different aspects of wound care because it's hard for us to do RCTs. However, I do still think that there's a lot we, we can do. So if I take the example of wearing face masks, prior to COVID, the evidence around that was quite weak, but now it's something that we've all adopted. So for me, yes, evidence matters, and you always get people push back against the evidence. But for the majority of people, it's about breaking it down into a very simple narrative um, about what they can do. So in terms of practical steps, I think, one, identify key people who you can get on your side. Two, have a local champion who can support the implementation of the guidelines and have a very simple and succinct message for everyone um, that they can take forward about what they can do practically and the simpler the better, I think. Can I also add that sometimes it's very important to make people feel valued, that when you're actually implementing something, their uh, feedback, their evaluations are really valued. And I think Ray made reference to that. It's about asking people how to you know, how they think they could implement the guidelines within their clinical area or for their own care if it's for an adult who's self-caring. And I know from my past experience as a tissue viability nurse, I often went to evaluate products on, maybe, on, on wards that weren't perhaps performing as well as others. It wasn't the most outstanding ward because what I wanted to do is increase motivation and improve uh, worth you know, worthness. We, we all want to have meaning and purpose. And I know our OT colleagues, that is the focus of everything that you do. And therefore it's transferring those wonderful skills that OTs do day in, day out. Uh, and, and nurses, good leaders into wards, departments and with adults to make changes, you know, so they move through the liminal spaces. Okay, thank you. Just come back in a minute, Carol. For seating assessment, how do the two dimensions shown on the slide cover assessment of rotation at the pelvis or shoulder girdle? Uh, they don't on the slide I've done there tonight. Um, we've had time limitations tonight, so it's a real sort of basic overview. And um, certainly if I'm doing, there's, there's lots of other uh, models that you can use as well that would incorporate that. Or for me, it's about getting that information down, not about what model or picture I use. It's just making sure that I have that information written down. So I would very often just write, if it was rotation, how many centimetres forward, or if it was a pelvic obliquity, how many centimetres down or up on left or right. Uh, I wouldn't particularly have a diagram for every single one. But, you know, we all learn differently. And, you know, for the people that are very visual learners, then, you know, models and things that you can use, um, they are relevant. But I haven't shown one for, particularly for rotation because I, I could have commandeered the whole of the evening. Yeah. With, yeah. With <laughs> and believers, she could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could. Right, okay, so that's the end of the questions. Thank you ever so much, everyone, for taking part in this webinar and for all your questions. And we're sorry if we didn't get to, to yours, but we will endeavour to respond separately after the webinar's completed. If you found it useful, spread the news and let your friends and colleagues know about this webinar that they can do, watch it on Catch Up. Um, and don't forget to complete the post-webinar survey. Good evening, everybody. Take care, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.